Good morning, Dog Nation. I am Brandon Adams. This is Dog Nation Daily, the daily podcast for Georgia Bulldogs fans. We're presented today by Pella Window and Door of Georgia, and we are happy to have you with us. And right now, the college football world, everybody talking about UGA recruiting and the run the dogs have been on over the course of, what, the last nine days or so. Uh, quite an impressive streak here. We'll talk about what it means, why it matters, and also coming up in a couple of minutes today there as well. Um, there is already one really, really big way that this year, the season we're about to have, is kind of already playing out like last year did. This could be a good thing for UGA. So we'll do that. John Stinchcomb stops by. Uh, we'll take an interesting look at another one of Georgia's SEC rivals in terms of what exactly is going on here. A lot of fans starting to ask some questions. We'll kind of get into that. And the very weird situation around Northwestern, we'll cover some of that too. This is All interesting stuff. We're going to roll through it with you today. So what do you say? Without further ado, let us get it all started. It is Dog Nation Daily, the daily podcast for Georgia Bulldogs fans, presented today by Pella Window and Door of Georgia. And it begins right now. Today's episode of Dog Nation Daily is brought to you by Pella Window and Door of Georgia, viewed to be the best. Presented by DogNation.com, this is Dog Nation Daily, the daily podcast for Georgia Bulldogs fans. Here's your host, Brandon Adams. A lot has happened since we last spoke. We sort of expected it to, and it kind of played out exactly the way we thought that it would. Georgia has added another pair of very impressive commits to what has been quite a streak for the dogs as of late. Let me give you, as they used to say on the HBO Boxing Show, the official particulars here. And then after that, we'll kind of talk about what all of this means. Let me start with Friday evening. I told you on the show Friday morning that if Georgia got good news and recruiting on Friday evening, I would not be available to pop on video to talk to you about it. Uh, we sort of had a thought this might be coming, and indeed it worked out exactly that way. Let me show you what to like about Nyer Daniels right now. First of all, he comes down south from the Garden State, so not only do you credit uh, – uh, uh, Stacey Searles, the Georgia offensive line coach here, but you also credit Fran Brown, who's done great work up in the Northeast for Georgia since becoming Georgia's cornerbacks coach, but helping out anytime Georgia wants to go into New Jersey. Nyer Daniels committing to the program. Let's show you uh, what Daniels brings to the table. How about 6'8", 360 pounds? That is a giant of a man, of course. He's also the number one, number 164 player in the country, according to the 24-7 Sports Composites. You're talking about a very big player, but also a major add in terms of his overall recruiting ranking. This is what Georgia went into New Jersey and brought home uh, there on Friday evening. But not to be outdone, shortly after that on Saturday, Georgia was going out and winning another recruiting battle for another four-star offensive lineman. Let's talk about Marquez Easley, who also joined up with this 2024 class. And once again, we'll give you the tail of the tape on Easley. And once again, it's incredibly impressive. How about 6'6", 330 pounds, also a four-star offensive tackle. So over the course of the last, well, you will go back since last Friday, that's what, a total of nine days. Over the course of the last nine days, Georgia has added four four-star offensive linemen. Started with Michael Uini last Friday, continuing with Daniel Calhoun, the number 15 player in the state of Georgia, then Nyer Daniels and Marquez Easley there on Saturday. An unbelievable stretch. And in the story that Jeff Sintel wrote about Marquez Easley, I thought that Jeff said a sentence, and Jeff, listen, I, I'm kind of a pro wrestling, you know, uh, carnival barker, state fair type guy. I, I'm one of these guys, like, there's no time on, on any given day what I might say. Uh, you know, <laughs> I'm sure if you go back and listen to all the archives over the years, I've said some doozies over the years that, you know, maybe I might be forced to reconsider. That's just sort of what you do when you speak into a microphone for a living, I guess. Jeff, though, is a scribe. He is a writer. He chooses his words far more carefully than maybe I do on a day-to-day basis. But even Jeff kind of got caught up in the hyperbole after the success that Georgia has had with the four commits that I just mentioned. In in the story that Jeff wrote when Marquez easily committed to Georgia, uh, one of the statements that Jeff made, I, I think, properly sums up in very succinct fashion exactly what this is all about for Georgia here right now. Let me read you this uh, sentence here from Jeff. He says, this recruiting pace, the one that includes Ewini, then Calhoun, then Daniels, then Easley, this recruiting pace that the dogs are on right now, Jeff says, is, quote, unheard of in Georgia football history. 
How about that from Jeff Sintel and Dog Nation? Well said, properly described, because what Georgia is doing right now is knocking them down, putting trophies on the wall over and over again. In fact, I want to do a little research here, and which is always a dangerous thing for me, but I want to do a little research here to sort of properly contextualize exactly what Jeff might have meant by a statement like an unheard of pace for UGA recruiting. And what I discovered is I just mentioned to you four four-star offensive linemen who've joined this program since last Friday, just slightly more than one week. Do you know there was only one team in the entire SEC a year ago that signed four four-star offensive linemen? It was Alabama. Not even Georgia had four four-star offensive linemen a year ago. And yet Georgia just added four over the course of basically a one-week span. That's what Jeff Sintel means when he says, hey, you know, Georgia is on an unheard of pace. They are literally recruiting a level of offensive line talent basically unmatched in the SEC, and they're doing it over the course of a span of a few days. Now, this is also one of those things where the best time to plant a tree was 20 years ago. A lot of these offensive line, line of scrimmage type recruits, these are long-range recruitment. These are battles that are won over the course of years, and a lot of what we've just seen the last week or so is just sort of the harvest of the uh, heavy planting and working that George has been doing over this. But, But still, we all got this official public news over the span of about seven days, and it's a level of riches that other SEC programs aren't able to match over over the course of a full year. And in fact, I'll go so far as to say this. Even though individually, Uini and Calhoun and and Nair Daniels and Marquez Easley, even though individually they aren't nearly as famous as a guy like Dylan Riola, the number one overall recruit, the five-star quarterback, even though individually none of those quarterbacks kind of compare from a fame standpoint to what Riola is, Riola kind of cuts through the clutter and becomes this recruiting story that mainstream fans who aren't quite as obsessed as many of us are, some would say people who are less crazy than some of us are, but you can, I guess, be your own judge on some of that one way or another. But the point is is that Dylan Riola is famous to everybody. The four names that I just mentioned individually aren't nearly as famous, but when you combine them collectively, y'all – I believe the run that George has been on since last Friday is just as impressive, if not more impressive, than the prowess that it took to get the commitment of Dylan Riola. The Riola news gets more attention, but when you repopulate your offensive line as rapidly as Georgia has over the course of these last few days, this speaks to a level of recruiting prowess that Jeff Centel, our Dog Nation Recruiting Insider, correctly says is unheard of in Georgia football uh, you know, history here. And the, the context of this is important. We know that offensive line, while it seems like George is incredibly deep right now, we know this is going to be a position of need moving forward. Look at the starting offensive lineman for Georgia this season. Uh, Cedric Von Prahn Granger, he's going to be gone. Amarius Mims, he could be gone. Uh, you know, you, uh, you, know you, you look at uh, uh, Tate Rattledge could be gone. You look at Xavier Trust could be gone. You may lose a couple other guys, you know, from the, the, the backup ranks after that. You're talking about a situation in which Georgia stands to lose four of its what, five starting offensive linemen for this upcoming season. Or on your screen, the only guy that has eligibility obviously coming back for the 2024 season. You could lose your four other starters. You may lose more depth other than that. So, so therefore, you needed to rebuild behind them, reload behind them, maybe the more operative uh, phrase. And that's exactly what George is going on doing. When you kind of do this kind of heavy lifting over the, court of, over the course of such a short span of time, then I do think rightly it should be compared to bringing in a guy like Dylan Raiola. This just as impressive, if not more so. And the other thing I really like about what Georgia has done here by bringing in Daniels, by bringing in Easley, in fact, when you read their stories at dognation.com, there is a very striking similarity between both these guys, and I guess striking may be the operative word there. Both Daniels and Easley talk about how much they like the physical part of the game. They talk about you know the enjoyment of of being a part of the run blocking. That's the you know that that's the kind of uh, offensive line you know football where you really got to roll up your sleeves. You really got to win that street fight in order to be able to move bodies in that run game. And these two guys, they talk about wanting to do that. They talk about embracing the contact, embracing the physicality. And there's an element in which Georgia stays Georgia with all of this because for all the flash and glamour of being the two-time national champion and all the guys that go on to get very rich in the first round of the NFL draft, ultimately football remains a physical game. It remains a game in which there are certain types of men who just embrace that part of it more so than others. And if you really want to differentiate who's likely to succeed from maybe who's 
just less likely to be able to. It's the willingness to embrace the physical part of the game and the hard work required to put yourself in a position to win those fights when they take place. You know, ultimately, that's going to go a long way towards determining you know who can succeed. And the teams that have more of those kinds of players are just in a better position to be able to succeed. And it seems like that's maybe what Georgia has brought in here when it comes to Daniels and Easley. It also finishes off a stretch that we were promised. You know, we'll go back. You know, Jeff Sintel on our show a couple of weeks ago said, "Hey, watch out for the next however many days." And he rattled off those four names. Well, guess what? Georgia clean swept it. They went four for four in the case of Easley. I guess the amazing part of that is, is when he put out his top three finalists of the day, he didn't even have Georgia among the group. You know, ultimately, Georgia still wins here. So Georgia goes four for four with four very big offensive line targets. Position of need for the 2024 season with all the guys that could be leaving. Guys who seem ready to embrace the physicality that's made Georgia so special. You will pay attention to the uh, Dylan Riolas, and clearly that gets the excitement going for a lot of fans. But the nuts and bolts, the bricks and mortar for a football team is what happens on the line of scrimmage. Georgia takes that very, very seriously. And they've never been better at recruiting those type of guys than they are right now. My name's Brandon Adams, and this is Dog Nation Daily, the daily podcast for Georgia Bulldogs fans. We are presented today by Pella Window and Door of Georgia, and we are happy to have you with us, no matter how you get to us. Live on video, we start 945, first and 15, dognation.com, Dog Nation app. 10 a.m. after that, Facebook, YouTube, Twitter, Twitch, or the radio at noon on Athens Sports Radio 960 The Ref, and we are available as a podcast wherever you find them, Apple, Spotify. We post the show to the worldfamousdognation.com. We just try to make the show as accessible as we possibly can. We certainly appreciate you being a part of it each and every day, whichever platform you choose to use. Also, a big thanks to our friends at Palo Window and Door of Georgia who make it all possible. Taking really good care of your home is one of the best decisions you can make if you are a homeowner. Doing what you can do to make it feel good on the inside, look good on the outside, and that's what pellet windows and pellet doors are all about. We say viewed to be the best. What we mean by that is, you know, there are surveys, there are there are you know questions that go out to homeowners here in our market area, and year after year, Pella really is recognized as the one that is the best, the one that uh, is just going to improve the quality of your home. And when you want to resell that, the things you do to take good care of your home. That's one of the ways you can improve the value. But when you're living in your home and enjoying it, this is one of the things that makes it more enjoyable too, knowing you took every step you could take to really put, you know, the proper emphasis on the place where you got your, you know, grace financial investment, but also the collection of your your most important memories. That's what your home's all about. And that's what Pella windows and doors are all about for you there as well. So it may be time now for you to go ahead and get a conversation going with one of those Pella experts. It's a no pressure consultation, of course, and just sort of talk through the installation options, the full product line, and if necessary, some financing options there as well, and just sort of find out what makes the Pella product different. You, in fact, you can go see them in their experience center there in Duluth. Put your hands on it. Feel the windows. Feel the doors. They're substantial. You, you can tell there's something different about these, and that's what Pella wants to bring to the uh, forefront for you, and great savings too, because between now and July 31st, you can get 10% off your entire project or no payments, no interest for 12 months. That's what they're all about. So stop by and see them right there in Duluth or go online. Pella of GA.com slash dog nation. That's Pella of GA.com slash dog nation or give them a call. 678-638-1429. That's 678-638-1429. Just make sure you tell them that BA from Dog Nation Daily said they would take good care of you because I truly know that they will. Pella Window in Door, Georgia is viewed to be the best. All right, here on Dog Nation Daily, presented by Pella Window and Door of Georgia today. Coming up in a couple of minutes, we're going to talk to John Stinchcomb. And one of the things we'll obviously talk to John about is, as we said before, the impressive run that Georgia's been on with offensive line recruits over the course of the uh, last few days. When John and I last spoke, Michael Uini had kind of come into the fold. But since then, three more big ads along the offensive line. We'll talk to John about exactly what that means and kind of what John looks for when it comes to these kinds of offensive line prospects. But prior to that, I want to go around the doghouse. Poured today by our friends at Dr. Pepper Strawberries and Cream. And there is one way for this upcoming season that things seemingly are already playing out much like they would have a year ago. And this for Georgia, I think, could be a very good thing. Let's go back to last November. And if you want to think about a 15-0 season for Georgia, which included you know SEC championship win against LSU, thrilling Ohio State win against the in the Peach Bowl, 
uh, obviously a 65-7 to national championship win against TCU. No disrespect to anything that happened for Georgia during the postseason, including that nail, nail-biter knockdown drag out against Ohio State. The most significant moment of the year for Georgia may have actually happened in November. The thing that Georgia fans may call back upon as much as anything else may be the game against Tennessee. Because of the atmosphere at Sanford Stadium, the fact that Georgia fans stepped up and created the environment that really helped Georgia get that win on that particular Saturday. But the other context for that win against Tennessee, Tennessee, after all, was the CFP number one team coming to Athens that day. The additional context of that Georgia-Tennessee game was all the hype that Tennessee was getting and some of the criticism that, that Georgia was getting. And I think it's important to go back and relive this because that's what made the atmosphere in the stadium so intense. I believe that's one of the things that gave Georgia on the field such an edge. It certainly made Georgia fans nasty that day. You talk about you know wanting to fight, not physically fight, but create the kind of you know fight in the stadium that that helped propel Georgia to victory. You better believe that Georgia fans were fueled up to do that uh, way back in November. And some of this was all of the bad things being said about Georgia, all of the doubts that seemingly existed about Georgia during that time. You can't understand what made the Tennessee win so sweet without appreciating the fact there were a lot of people who just thought Georgia, for whatever reason, was ready to flop, was ready to fall flat on its face, and that somehow the 2021 season, I guess it had been a fluke, and all those draft picks that Georgia had to replace, this was going to be the moment when you realized that those guys just weren't there anymore. In fact, a lot of you remember one of the things that ESPN had said about Georgia, or I guess there was a story about the game, and they quoted an anonymous coach. It always seems like there's anonymous coaches you know, using cowardice and you know, anonymity to uh, take jabs at Georgia. It seems like Georgia suffers from a lot of that from time to time for whatever reason. You, I guess you can try to figure that out yourself. Uh, but anonymous coach, quoted by ESPN, really just ripping into Georgia and, and, and really just acting like Georgia just had no chance against Tennessee there that day. Let me read you the quote because I think the context here is important for where we are about to go on all of this. This is what anonymous coach told ESPN about Georgia prior to playing Tennessee last year. Uh, The quote was, I won't be surprised if Tennessee scores 50 points, a coach said. Georgia's front is average. Their back end is below average. They really miss William Poole, which is, I guess I'll just leave that alone. I don't think their corners are special. Keely Ringo, he doesn't run really as well as you'd expect. The others are just okay. They're going to run right by those corners that they in this particular case being the Tennessee Vols and you remember how this was that quotes like that were fueling the narrative and Tennessee fans were strutting their way into Athens as if they were just going to dominate Georgia because you know a lot of these Tennessee fans will believe whatever you tell them and they were told that they were going to do so so therefore you know like simps they were just kind of just believing whatever they're told and they just thought it was going to be the easy, easiest game in the world because that's what ESPN reported to them was going to be the case. And they were just shocked. They were shocked when the game actually played out that all the stuff the anonymous coaches had been saying and all the stuff that you know random talking heads on TV had been saying, all of that turned out to be untrue. All of that turned out to be made up. It was not true at all. And Tennessee fans were shocked. But concurrent to that, while all of this sort of narrative stuff was going on and uh, people were sort of, you know, saying and believing whatever. You'll remember that the point spread, the people who put their money where their mouth is, that didn't move at all. Do you remember this? That you may have had, you know, coaches on ESPN, you know, saying that Georgia's going to give up 50 points, talking head on TV. I mean, the entire ESPN College Game Day crew pretty much were all on Tennessee, right? We all kind of remember that. And yet, no matter how many talking heads who say one thing and five minutes later nobody really remembers it, there's no real retribution or punishment for ever getting anything wrong. Um, So talking heads were all saying one thing, but the point spread folks, the Vegas folks, the sports book folks, the people who stand to lose money if their opinion is wrong, they were all Georgia all the time. They had Georgia as a sizable favorite there in that game. And I always remember that kind of stood as a very, very sharp contrast there, that there is very little gained or lost by some sort of hot take on TV or the streaming internet or something like that. There is very little gain, very little loss by that, and so people just sort of say whatever. But the point spread, folks, the the lines makers, the odds makers, the Vegases, and the online sports books, whatever else, they 
are forced to be more conservative about this kind of stuff. They are forced to be a little bit more cautious about this kind of stuff. And they were all Georgia. They had the dogs sort of about a nine-point favorite or so, and they clearly got that right. And I say all of that to say that much like that played out a year ago, something very similar is playing out right now. Because once again, the talking heads and the loud mouths and the hot take artists are sort of back doing their same thing again. And once again, it just so happens this is taking place at the expense of George. I'll give you a brief reminder here for a couple of seconds about just how profound and prolific some of this has been so far uh, this summer, starting with Kirk Herbstreet, who the other day made a case, as specious as the claim is here, but none the case, made a case for Alabama winning the national championship. This is what Kirk Herbstreet said going back to what, about a month or so ago? Here's Kirk. It's hard for me not to lean towards Alabama in the SEC, just because of what you described. Now you got LSU, who made incredible strides in that first year with Brian Kelly. Got a lot coming back from that team. They beat Bama last year. They got to go to Tuscaloosa. So I would, I would. Those three are going to be everybody's three. As we sit here right now, I'm going to wait to see where we are in August. But I would be in that Bama LSU, just a little bit ahead of Georgia, um, as we get ready for you know getting into the summer months. No, well, Kirk actually said it was much longer than that. We just don't have time to play at all. But doesn't that kind of remind you of some of the stuff before the Georgia-Tennessee game where, you know, in Kirk Herbstreit's case, oh, my gosh, Alabama. Oh, Alabama, 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 as if this was still 20, you know, 15 or something like that. Oh, my gosh, Alabama. Well, guess what? One of Kirk's game day partners, Reese Davis, has a different team other than Georgia, who he thinks is going to win the national championship. You know this already. But for context, here's a reminder of Reese Davis making the case for Michigan being the number one team. Once again, not Georgia, but a different team. It's Michigan. This is what Reese Davis said about that. Michigan has a proven quarterback that I think is going to improve greatly this year. They've got the best cornerback in America and Will Johnson. They've got some transfers on both lines of scrimmage, including a pass rusher that should shore up some of the things that they've lost. They've done a really good job in the transfer portal the last couple of years, particularly on the lines of scrimmage. They've got their running backs coming back, a couple of uh, wide receivers that might even be bigger threats, uh, transfer tight end from Indiana, I believe. They, I think if I had to fill out the ballot right now based on what I know, you know, what I, the type of production I know I'm going to get, I think I'd put Michigan number one. So two of the most prominent voices in all of college football and TV, fixtures on college game day for a very long time, Kirk Herbstreet all in on Bama, Reese Davis all in on Michigan. And it reminds you a little bit of some of the way in which seemingly Georgia had been completely had its back turned on by every media type part of the game against Tennessee. But what's interesting is, while all of the talking heads and the media types and the hot take artists and whatever else, while everyone is shopping seemingly for a team other than Georgia win this year's national championship, once again, the people who put their money where their mouth is, the people who stand to have their wallets lightened if they are wrong, they are not doing any of this whatsoever. They are essentially looking at all the talking head stuff, the talking season nonsense, they are looking at it with laughter because uh, I'll show you this on the screen here from one of our friends at On3 had this from BetMGM. With all the talk about someone other than Georgia winning the national championship, Georgia is still the, I would say, overwhelming favor to win this year's national championship. They are plus 220. That's essentially just more than 2-1 to one for the national title. Bama, Kirk Herbstreet's favorite, they're only 6-1. to one. Uh, Reese Davis touts Michigan, they're just 9-1. to one. Ohio State, they're seven to one. LSU's twelve to one. USC fourteen to one. Clemson's eighteen to one. Uh, Florida State eighteen to one there as well. Texas, who I've talked a little bit about, they're twenty two uh, twenty two to one. If you want a uh, Penn State, you can get them at twenty five to one. Maybe not terrible value down at the bottom end of all of that. But, but but the point here is is that this is just like a year ago. And if you're a Georgia fan, I think you probably already take great comfort from this. People can say what they want to say. Words are truly very cheap. However, point spreads and betting lines oftentimes are not cheap. If you uh, talk a big game there and make a bet uh, that, that, that doesn't work out, there is big money loss. And if you're an odds maker, a sports book, and you set a bad line, then you stand to lose a ton of money on that there as well. So in the space in which opinions have to have a monetary and a dollar figure attached to them, 
That's still all Georgia, kind of like it was a year ago prior to the Tennessee game throughout the college football playoff and everything else. So Georgia fans, I think you probably already do take some comfort from this, and this is a reason why you should. The Reese Davises and the Kirk Herbstreets and the whoever else, they can say what they want. The odds makers speak with a much louder voice because their opinions come attached to dollar figures, and they're still just as high on Georgia as they ever were. And that is around the doghouse. And it's poured today by Dr. Pepper Strawberries and Cream. Now, listen, y'all know how much I love, at least many of you do anyway, how much I love Dr. Pepper. I've been Dr. Pepper obsessed for since I was a child. I just love it. And I am so excited about the brand new offering from Dr. Pepper, Dr. Pepper Strawberries and Cream. There's also a Dr. Pepper Strawberries and Cream Zero Sugar there, too, because like the one thing that Dr. Pepper is famous for, their Zero Sugar offerings are just as good and just as tasty as the other kind. That's something that's been true for Dr. Pepper for a long time. That's also true for Dr. Pepper Strawberries and Cream there as well. So anytime there's a brand new permanent flavor offering from our friends at Dr. Pepper, that is a really big deal. And y'all, Dr. Pepper Strawberries and Cream is a really big deal too. So you can find it at Kroger. You can find it wherever you're doing your shopping. Uh, and you can pick some up. You can try it. You talk about fun, to you know, hang out, you know, you're having a good time. That Dr. Pepper Strawberries and Cream is a great accompaniment to whatever you've got going on here this summer. So try some. If you love Dr. Pepper, I think you're going to like the brand new offering from Dr. Pepper, which is Dr. Pepper Strawberries and Cream and Dr. Pepper Strawberries and Cream Zero Sugar. Make sure you check some out today. Now, before we're done on our program today, we've got a lot we're going to check out, including uh, a very, very troubling list of allegations against the Northwestern football program. This has pretty big reverberations around college football, so we'll get to some of that here coming up in just a uh, little bit. I think this is concerning. Uh, On a completely different uh, topic, we'll also talk a little bit about what's going on with Alabama recruiting. They did pick up a couple of commits here this week, uh, this weekend, but still some kind of questions kind of being asked about what's exactly going on there. And we'll sort of try to separate fact and fiction on that uh, coming up in just a little bit. So that ought to be a lot of fun. In light of the topic we just had, we also have a very funny golden shoe that we'll get to on today's program there too. And one pretty prominent analyst is kind of talking up something that I had sort of talked about at one time, maybe making me feel just a little bit better about one of my college football playoff picks. We'll tell you about that here coming up in just a little bit too. But for now, As we said to start our program, Georgia on an incredible hot streak when it comes to recruiting, bringing in four big-time offensive line recruits and commits over the course of the last mm, slightly more than one week. So we'll talk about that and so much more with John Stinchcomb today, the great former Georgia All-American here on Dog Nation Daily, presented by Pella Window and Door of Georgia. From Athens and across the SEC or wherever the recruiting trail may lead, here's a DogNation.com insider. So we'll say hello to John Stinchcomb, and obviously one of the things I want to talk to John about here in a moment is that great run of recruiting that George has been on with the offensive line. The last time John and I spoke, we were talking about the first of those commits, and now there are plenty more to be added. We'll get to that here in a moment. But, John, before we get to that, I was just talking about the fact that it's amazing to me that in one respect, some of what's playing out for Georgia this offseason feels a little bit like last year during the season in which, you know, when you're the top dog in college football, no pun intended, there's always going to be a temptation to want to have your biggest, boldest opinion be about that team. If you're in the business of, you know, internet stuff or TV stuff, whatever else, those opinions just generate more interest. We kind of understand that. And yet, while last year a lot of folks were talking up teams other than Georgia, sometimes at the expense of Georgia, the overall odds never really moved. Vegas almost always sort of viewed Georgia as by far and away the most likely national champion. Once again, the same thing's true this offseason there as well, where there's touting for Michigan, there's touting for uh, Alabama, there may even be some love out there for Ohio State. But the odds makers still see Georgia as the overwhelming favorite here. And, John, if you're a UGA fan, I think you should probably take some comfort in that. I think it's great news and and obviously earned. I I was listening to your piece and the national pundits out there are certainly uh, trying to make headlines and and give hope across the board. I, I think there are other programs that are in the conversation. Obviously, you have to play the games and you look at the game against Ohio State last year and you have to have things break your way to, to make those sorts of runs. But you look at the schedule for Georgia this year. You look at the amount of talent that they have coming back and then have what they've done 
continue to do in recruiting and player development and, and the additions to the transfer portal. And there's no reason to believe that Georgia is not the team to beat, continues to be the team to beat. So uh, as, as much as you can make a case for uh, representatives out of the SEC West or, um, you know, some others that should be in the conversation, Georgia remains the top of the dog, top dog in the, in the hunt. I say this all the time as a fan of Georgia, not just someone who does a Georgia show, but a fan of Georgia. I have pretty thick skin about what people might say about my favorite team. I really don't get my feelings hurt too bad. I think that's probably a, you know, a good trait to have in life. I, I don't, I don't get bothered too much while, by what people might say about UGA. However, there is one aspect of this off season that has kind of aggravated me just a little bit. I want to see if you understand where I'm coming from. I have zero problem with somebody if somebody wants to make a case for someone else winning a championship. That's just someone's right, someone's prerogative. But I don't feel like it's been fully appreciated yet. Maybe it will be. We're going to have SEC media days coming up, uh, you know, I guess, what, next week. Um, but I don't think it's been properly appreciated yet just how significant the storyline is of Georgia going for a third straight national championship. This hasn't happened mm. essentially ever in college football, if you kind of think of the modern time frame. It has happened going back to the 1930s, but that's basically ancient history, truly, uh, when it comes to college football. And from that standpoint, I don't think people have properly appreciated this. It doesn't hurt my feelings. I just think it's ignorant. I think it shows a misunderstanding of of just how significant this year could be that Georgia could be, and their favor too, put the finishing touches on a streak of dominance unlike anything else in college football. And yes, I know how many national championships Nick Saban has won in Alabama, but he didn't win three straight. And you go back to when we were kids, John, you know, Florida State was in the top five every single year, but they didn't win three straight national championships that, you know, you know, Nebraska, their run. You know, you want to go back and cite these great college football kind of dynasties that pop up. Georgia, I believe, would be differentiating themselves from all of them if it were to win this year. And I don't think yet that's been properly considered. Maybe it's about to be. We're only just now kind of getting into the full-fledged talking season. But up until this point in time, it seems like that history has kind of been shortchanged to me a bit. Yeah, I, I think that talk is only going to expand as we get into the season. You look at Georgia's schedule, and you have to think that's pretty favorable. And uh, you imagine that the national attention is going to grow. You, you've got a couple games that you've already circled. Obviously, Tennessee is going to be a big one. But um, as Georgia clicks off the wins and they prove all of the talk that's been going around uh, in this off season that it, there's some validity that they're the team to beat, uh, then you start looking at the, the implications and the historical impact that a third national championship would have for any program, where they stand, uh, the, the conversation of um, who's the, the best coach in college football and which program. I think we already recognize that Georgia has the dominant program currently in the landscape, similar to some of the other teams of different eras. Uh, you mentioned a few, obviously Alabama being one of the more recent dominant programs, and, and now that's Georgia. So uh, the opportunity to, to set records uh, at the level that Georgia has, it's pretty unique. And I think that that's going to draw even more attention as, as they get into the season. But uh, just – Looking back, uh, obviously, college football has changed, right? I, it, heading into the season, there's maybe five teams that have a, uh, a realistic opportunity to, to win a national championship. I think that's different than years past. I think that the parity has, has changed across, across college football, and there are truly the haves and the have-nots, and Georgia has found a way to – earn their way to the top of that heap. What does it say to you when Georgia, over the course of a nine-day span, adds four four-star offensive linemen? All of these guys are top recruits. Uh, and to be able to bring them all in in such a short span of time, to me, that's quite a flex. And I'll compare it to bringing in a guy like Dylan Riola. As big as it is to bring in the number one overall quarterback, a quarterback is nothing without guys to block for him. And knowing what the position of need is, uh, offensive line might be for Georgia on the field in 2024 to clean house like this over the course of about a week's worth of time. Uh, John, I just think this is as impressive as anything that Georgia has done here 
Uh, it's your position, so clearly you're, I'm sure, fired up about it. What do you what do you make of the run that George has been on here as of late? It is it is truly an impressive feat. Coach Cyril's needs to get the praise that he is receiving this week because you, you don't see this often. Uh, four four star players in one position group that should be impactful for for years to come. Uh, it's huge, and these championships, the, the differentiating factor, I know the game is evolving and, and wide receivers are more important than they've ever been, but if you can't, if you can't get your quarterback time enough to, to distribute the football, you're going to struggle. And the programs that cannot build and continue to grow in the trenches are going to struggle and have struggled, and when they come into the big games, that's when you see uh, the wheat separate from the chaff. And Georgia, this past couple of weeks, has put their stamp on the fact that we're not going anywhere. And uh, the, the changing of the guard in that position group room, uh, with Coach Searles taking, taking the reins, there's been no drop-off. So it's a huge win across the board for Georgia. And picking up these, these caliber players uh, just projects the – continued dominance and relevance on a national scale how important i mean this is obviously an overly simplistic question but the sheer size that we're talking about here we're talking about you know six six guys six eight guys 330 guys 380 not 380 360 you know you're talking about like i mean just in like the one percent of one percenters in terms of the overall size there like how like what does that mean for georgia when you're talking about a, a future offensive line that across the board is going to kind of be blocking out the sun the way that a future offensive line for Georgia might be. <laughs> well, I mean, you, you, you got to have you got to start with a nice piece of clay for the potter. I mean, you're looking at guys that uh, can move at those, that size. And of the few highlight films that I've seen of the the most recent additions, um, and having seen oh crap, Daniel Calhoun is that right? That's his name. That's correct? right. That's right. Yeah, so I, I saw him firsthand, and let me tell you, the guy moves well. Okay, it's uh, it's impressive to see. So, you, not only the size, and especially in high school, there's a lot of matchups you can just win by overwhelming players. I think you watch breakdowns of any of the uh, players that are getting recruited by Georgia and Alabama, and and, and some of the national leaders, and they win some of those matchups in high school just because they're so much bigger but then you watch the way they move and you say ah there's the difference because a lot of you know working with high school players and and athletes a lot of them feel like oh well I know in the NFL I know in college I've got to be 300 plus pounds so they just put on a lot of weight and you can push around a 220 pound defensive lineman in high school but if you can't move, then that doesn't translate very well to the next level. And what distinguishes this group of, of players, the, the caliber of player that Georgia recruits and, and gets commitments from, is their ability to move at that size. And it's impressive, especially you're talking about 17, 18-year-old men that haven't had the development in time that their college counterparts have invested in uh, developing. You know, it's it's every 320 is not made the same, and to see the athleticism that's paired with that size is is what makes these guys truly special. And I think this probably goes without saying, but I want to talk about it a little bit anyway. Is that you know, concurrent to this, you see Dylan Raiola coming into the program. George is obviously sort of chasing the kinds of wide receivers that would want to play with a quarterback like Dylan Raiola. The Georgia passing attack has upgraded itself the last couple of years. We believe that there's even better potential future there in terms of how Georgia throws the ball. But these kinds of offensive linemen, the bigger, you know, upper end size wise, you know, guys for these positions, John, this to me indicates that as Georgia continues to expand its passing attack, it's not going to be looking to do it with pace, right? You know, Georgia's not going to start playing like Tennessee plays at, at a pace like that, or even some of these other teams that sort of move a little bit faster. That that Georgia wants to throw the ball, I think it wants to throw the ball well. But but you're kind of 
uh, committing yourself to a certain kind of pace with offensive linemen this size. Now, I think that pace has worked out very well for Georgia, but 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 these very large offensive linemen, I think, should stand as an indication that as Georgia continues to try to upgrade its passing attack with the best quarterback prospect in the country in some future season, possibly – it's still going to play at the pace that it's been comfortable. Is that a fair read in on this? Uh, well, uh, maybe I don't. I don't quite see it that way. I okay. don't think we're going back to the Sam Pittman days where it's like we're getting these behemoths that we're going to put folks in a in a phone booth and lean on them. Um, I, I've worked with some guys coming out of Clemson when they played what amounted to speed ball, and they were getting, you know, 90 snaps in a game on average when, you know, the rest of the college football was getting 70. So um, size can be a factor in that, but a a lot of it plays the offensive line's advantage because the wear and tear it takes on the defense. Those are the guys that are trying to cover down on balls and, Mm -hmm. um, you know, a lot of the, the high repetition comes with the balls getting out pretty quickly. So that's not quite as demanding on the offensive line as um, some might think. You know, is if you've got enough skill players, those are the guys that are rotating through. For offensive linemen, it, it's almost a blessing when you have those 15-play drives. I know it's a, a drain on us, but that pass rush isn't quite the same on rep seven as it was one, two, and three. Uh, so for those bigger bodies, yes, uh, it can be a wear and tear on you, but I don't think it's an indication that um, it, it's going to impact the opportunities that Georgia would have as to how they want to attack a defense. I think you still have the flexibility to change tempo and uh, spread the ball around, pass game, run game. I don't see any of the, the players that have committed in the past couple of weeks as limiting as to what you could do offensively that's really interesting i'll finish with this one of the things i mentioned to our audience before you joined us was when you look at the stories at dognation.com on nair daniels and uh, marcus easley who who just committed over the course of the weekend one of the things that you see with both these guys is various quotes along the lines of they really enjoy that physical part of the game they like the idea of getting in there and just pounding on people and you know obviously you know, John, you can't play football if you don't embrace the physicality to a certain extent, but you played the game. You know this. There are other people within the game who just sort of embrace it more than others. And the thing I always say is, is I'd rather coach some calmness into a fighter than try to coach some fight into a guy that maybe doesn't quite have that in him. You have been trained as a player. Now, as you mentioned, you train other players. How valuable is it to kind of already have some of that just sort of natural fight in you it seems incredibly valuable for an offensive lineman but for someone who knows the 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 position how valuable is that you know you can coach technique you can coach uh, the intricacies of the game what it's really hard to do is change a player's identity and what they're about and when you get guys that come in that are nasty and are finishers and love the physicality of the game that's an approach that every coach wants and it's really hard to to change uh, the the stripes and spots on a uh, a player that does not have that approach, and so I'm sure that's those are characteristics that that you are looking for. I'm looking for guys that when I turn on the film, they're playing to the echo of the whistle, and when they have an opportunity to drive a guy ten yards and dump them, that's what they're going to do, and. That's the mentality that I think Georgia has embraced in practice, right? I mean, you talk about uh, what you hear from players during the season, and it's Georgia competes in in practice. They get after it as well or as hard or as demanding as any program across the country. Yeah, I'm listening to these guys with their own personal podcasts now, and um, that's the message that you hear recurrently is, Practices are hard. The demand is high. The off-season training is is difficult. And, you know, when you look across the college landscape, that's not always the case. There's been a change in approach, and uh, Georgia has certainly not been uh, one team to to fall in line with that new mentality and uh, approach that 
physicality is optional, uh, especially in practice. So when you look at these players that, that are getting signed and you're hearing what, uh, what they're about, that is lockstep and key right in line with what Georgia has, has tried to create as an identity and what they're looking for in this next crop of players. John, it's such a fun conversation. I enjoy your insight into this kind of stuff so much. Obviously, you played the game at a high level, and I'm sure you're loving the way in which uh, Georgia continues to populate these offensive lines with players who have a chance to do the very same thing. Great time. Appreciate that. We'll look forward to talking to you again here on Dog Nation Daily, presented by Palo Endo and Door of Georgia again very, very soon. Always enjoy it, B.A. Go dog. Thank you, sir. Let's take a look around the rest of the league. This is SEC Through. Yeah, it's it's interesting. You know, John kind of comes at all of this from the perspective of someone who's just sort of been there and done it. And assumptions that I might make might not be true. As I said before, you know, when I hear the size, the specs of some of these guys, um, you know, I think, well, that's going to kind of restrict you to a certain kind of pace maybe. And John says, well, actually, no. You know, based on some of the offensive linemen I've worked with, that, that might not be quite as true as you might think. I just think it's an interesting conversation. And it's just sort of fun think about how chess pieces like this get moved around the board and a huge part of the college football job as a coach is bringing talent into your program but once it's there for a lot of people that's when the fun begins all of a sudden now it's okay what do I do with all this talent how do I how do I use it how do I develop it and that's the part that I think a lot of coaches really really like and that's the fun of the next couple of years here uh with this 2024 recruiting class but also the 2023 recruiting class as it kind of comes uh to full bloom here and then uh you know previous classes prior to that there as well that uh it's a constant cycle of talent and bringing them in developing them choosing to, how to use them on the football field that is what makes us come back to football each and every season because it is so much fun to watch and speaking of having so much fun our friends at royal Caribbean, you know how much fun they are there as well and one of my favorite things about Royal Caribbean is is there's always a great crop of new things to talk about. That that Royal Caribbean's obviously been incredibly successful in the cruise space, but they're not content just to sit on that and rest on their laurels, I guess as the saying might go. Always looking to create new, exciting things to get us talking and get us dreaming about and planning for. In fact, think about 2024, the debut of two brand new cruise ships. You've been hearing me talk a lot about Icon of the Seas. That's January of 2024. What an amazing thing that's going to be. But also keep in mind here or there as well is that the summer of 2024, that's about a year from now, July of 2024, brings on the debut of Utopia of the Seas. The latest when it comes to the Oasis class of ships, three and four night sailings going out of Port Canaveral. That's the, sort of the, what I think of in my home cruise port. Uh, that's going to be an amazing thing too. All kinds of great specialty restaurants, all of those various neighborhoods and the, kind of the fun stuff there. In fact, they're introducing some new concepts in terms of you know some of the bars and the lounges and things like that. Those kinds of exciting things always in store for Royal Caribbean in 2024 going to be a big example of that. And also, as you're thinking about new for 2024, think about the Dog Nation cruise there as well. Because the one thing we were told is we love the Dog Nation cruise. We want to be on the Dog Nation cruise. But we want it to be bigger and better than it's ever been before. We want to invite more people. We want to just make this an unbelievable celebration and an unbelievable blowout of all the things that makes Dog Nation great. And that's what we're going to do for you. In fact, can we show this on the screen here, the details for that Dog Nation cruise? Because I want to make sure people understand that these staterooms, even though we're still more than a year away, these staterooms are getting booked up fast because this year on the Dog Nation cruise, we're going to be on board Allure of the Sea. I told you before, Oasis-class ships, currently the largest category of ships sailing at sea. We're going to be on one of those Oasis-class ships for our Dog Nation cruise in April, April 22nd through the 26th. Uh, go to RoyalDogs.com, find out about going to Perfect Day, Coco Cay, NASA on the Bahamas, special Dog Nation-themed events there as well. State rooms already filling up. In fact, we've sold so many of these already, but we want you to be there as well. So go to RoyalDogs.com, find out how to be part of the Dog Nation cruise. All right, a couple of stories here cruising around the SEC, courtesy of Royal Caribbean here for a moment. A lot of Georgia fans starting to ask some questions about what might be going on with Alabama from a recruiting standpoint. The Crimson Tide did get a couple of commits over the weekend, and I guess that has done very little to kind of quiet down the overall conversation about what might be happening here. Let's start with the fact that Justin, and I'm going to butcher the pronunciation, even though it's a player we talked about before, Okoronkwo, the uh, linebacker who hails from Germany, I saw the 24-7 sports message. 
Uh, somebody had the headline, Alabama gets a commitment for the number two player in the country, dot, 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 of Germany. In the case, <laughs> that was a very funny thing. In the case of uh, Okoronkwo, uh, and listen, I think he is a good player. I mean, don't, don't get me wrong about this. But it's just a little bit of a different type of pace that Alabama's currently moving in when it comes to a recruiting standpoint. I'm not quite ready to say that Alabama's not going to have what we've come to expect, which is an elite class in them almost every year. They've really only had the one kind of drop-off year. They dropped off pretty heavily in 2018. Some people kind of saying that maybe Nick Saban wasn't quite ready for the pace of the early signing period when it first began in that 2018 cycle and had to try to play catch-up on that the following year, and for the most part kind of did. But right now, Alabama just seems to be moving a little bit of an interesting recruiting pace. Now, listen, they'll also come back and say, well, you know, Bama's going to be a factor to potentially flip at least one UGA commitment, possibly, if not another. So it's not like they're completely, you know, more bound on the recruiting trail right now, but it's just a little bit different type of uh, vibe around Alabama recruiting. They also got another commit this weekend. I thought this was kind of interesting. 2026 class, which feels like kind of a long way away from now, but a 2026 offensive lineman. His name's Zyke Helton. He's the center at Carrollton now. A lot of people are going to kind of read into this of, you know, is this Alabama's attempt to get involved with Julian Lewis? Lewis, the quarterback for Carrollton, I believe this year may be the most talked about player in the entire country, uh, including Dylan Raiola. You know, the, the hype around Lewis is just going to be extreme. He had a great freshman season a year ago, got Carrollton to the state final, and he's just going to be talked about so much here this year. Is this Alabama's attempt to say, because, you know, Alabama's got a lot of work doing its 2024 class. The idea they're taking a 2026 commit is a little bit of a an eye-opening thing, and some folks are going to kind of wonder if this is in some way connected to the Julian Lewis uh, recruitment at all. Obviously, everybody wants to plant their flag around Lewis right now. But a couple of commits, you know, for the 2026 class, kind of long range. Okoronkwo here for the uh, short term, the 2024, is not going to do a lot right now to quiet down the questions being asked because the Alabama – current ranking it's in the top 25 but it's certainly not into the top five top three or number one overall the way a lot of crimson tide fans expect to be i'll just reiterate, reiterate one more time i do not expect alabama to fall short of an elite class here this year my guess is they still put one together they'll probably do some late work to get there but it is interesting to watch the way in which the chatter around the crimson tide about what's going on with recruiting continues to build here this was quiet for a while getting a little bit louder and we'll see what alabama can do about all of this as a response i uh was very happy to see i don't oftentimes care about stuff like this but i told y'all the other day i was not that happy with my college ball playoff picks i just was a little bit i don't know i i, I was i was a little bit concerned about um you just sort of felt you got to find four somewhere. And in my college ball playoff official selections, when I made them the other day, one of the teams that I had in my college football playoff was Texas. And, you know, from that standpoint, I was, you know, you sort of feel like you've kind of gone down a road in which people have kind of gone down before and you end up, you know, kind of being embarrassed. The whole Texas is back meme, the joke about that. People have laughed about that, made fun of that. And frankly, I didn't want to fall prey to that myself. And so I, I guess I took some comfort the other day that the fact that Greg McElroy, the ESPN analyst, was also talking about that himself. And in fact, I read a recent quote from him. He says, you know, people want to say about the idea of, you know, hype for Texas. Here we go again. Um, but McElroy goes on to say uh, a lot of people say every, this every year. Every, here, here we go again. Why don't we continue to force Texas at everybody in the preseason? He says, believe me. As a media member, I do occasionally fall victim to the Texas fatigue. Now, remember, McElroy's from Texas, so his words on this carry a little bit of extra weight. He says, they're pretty good, y'all. They are pretty good. He means this year. He says, I think when you look at their roster, assuming significant growth at the quarterback spot, which I believe you can assume, uh, the wide receiver group can stay healthy, uh, he says, uh, which they couldn't do last year. He says, assuming all of that, they also have a pretty good running back there as well. But basically going on to say the idea that Texas could be a team very much worthy of considering for the college ball playoff. And I've said this before, you know, Quinn Ewers, um, I believe, is probably the quarterback right now. Nationally, we're talking about, you know, way too little, way too little. Are we talking about Quinn Ewers here right now? You know, Caleb Williams gets the attention because he's won the Heisman Trophy. Other quarterbacks going to get talked about for whatever reason. But the thing I keep going back to with Ewers, with all the high-profile quarterbacks in that Texas quarterback competition this spring, including Arch Manning, Malik Murphy also had a good spring too, but Ewers won the job with ease. So if you are distancing yourself that much from two pretty good quarterback prospects in their own right, 
to me, that tells me a lot about what yours might be. And after all, he had a pretty good year when he was healthy a year ago there as well. We showed you some of those odds to begin the show. Texas, somewhere in that neighborhood of, what, 22-1 to 1 or so to win this year's national championship. I do not believe they're going to win the national championship. But think about how those odds might change if they win week two at Alabama. That gives you an idea of where they are now and how quickly the perception of them could change if they admittedly tough task but were to go on the road and beat Alabama. The point is, is what Greg McElroy is saying here is pretty much what we saw on the show a few weeks ago, that for all the fatigue about going back down the road of Texas is back, Texas is back, the truth is, is that picking Texas – uh, to make this year's college football playoff is maybe not quite as outlandish as it seems like it would be, given the fact that Quinn Ewers is a very good quarterback, possibly even a Heisman Trophy winner, throwing to an incredibly explosive and impressive crop of wide receivers. And for a guy like Steve Sarkeesian, who you can say what you want to about him, the one thing you know about Sarkeesian is he's capable of devising creative and effective offensive attacks. He may have a chance to do that here this year. I think, until proven otherwise, once again this season, I think it's probably appropriate to take Texas pretty seriously. Interesting to hear that from Greg McElroy. And then finally, I'll give you this. Really, really strange, troubling allegations coming out of Northwestern, uh, the football program, the Big Big Ten, about, I guess, what you'd have to describe as very extreme hazing activity. This had been a story that had been kind of floating around for a, a while, and there's some new allegations that sort of suggest this was even more intense and more troubling than originally kind of thought to be, to the point where, like, Pat Fitzgerald, the Northwestern coach, there are like some legitimate questions being asked about if these allegations are true. There are some legitimate questions being asked about whether or not Fitzgerald will even coach again for Northwestern. Now, some of the reporting out there is a little bit weird on this. There are some who are pointing out that, hey, you know, maybe these allegations aren't quite as – there was a thing at Football Scoop, for instance, the other day, uh, yesterday, about maybe these allegations not being quite as clear-cut as they've been sort of led to be – Led, to, we've been led to believe they are, the whistleblower here – you know, what, whatever else, you can read more about that online at Football Scoop. But if we take this at face value and if we're led to believe that 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 large portions of these allegations are, are, are true, then it paints a really troubling picture there at Northwestern. What scares you, if you're a coach or a parent or something like that, is, is that Northwestern is a Big Ten school, so to get there, uh, you have to be the kind of athlete capable of playing at the high Division One level. But Northwestern is also a very, very prestigious academic school. So to get in Northwestern, you presumably have to have you know pretty good grades too. So what you're talking about here on the Northwestern side of things is is that athletes who are above average athletically to play you know the FBS level, the the Power Five level, above average intelligence, you know, to be able to be to a school like Northwestern, and yet still, if these allegations are true still very poorly developed in terms of understanding what's right and what's wrong. In other words, trained to be good at football, trained to be good at school, but not that very well trained at being good at being good, if you get my my point here on this, which sort of just reminds you that if these allegations are true, that is not a natural process, that that – you know, character education and, 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 and teaching right from wrong is still important, even in the sort of, you know, I, I guess the range of book learning and, uh, and athletics and things like that. Really, really odd, scary, troubling allegations coming out of Northwestern. You hope that, I guess, something comes out to kind of make yourself feel better about this, but, but pretty tough situation here. And a Big Ten coach fighting for his job because of that. Uh, that's worth following we'll tell you what happens next in that story and for now we'll make that cruising around the sec courtesy of royal caribbean and before we wrap up today and before we play the song uh uh speaking of the big 10 i want to give you a golden shoe because a lot has been made lately of michigan the fact that reese davis is you know picking this team to be his number one team in the college ball playoff and you know all, all this kind of stuff and the fact that michigan also supposedly during its practices is going to be devoting a period of practice to the George Bulldogs. They're going to call it their beat Georgia period. They're going to be focused on the team that's at the top of the college ball ranks. And we've said over and over that, you know, you can laugh about Michigan for doing this. Jim Harbaugh is a little bit of a strange guy. But ultimately, some of this is just paying proper deference to Georgia, recognizing who the best really is, recognizing who is on top of the college football world. So we're actually not that mad at the Wolverines for wanting to talk about beating Georgia during practice. Having aspirational goals is probably a pretty good plan for anybody in life. But there are others who are talking about just how obsessed Michigan must be with Georgia if they're mentioning Georgia in practice as frequently as apparently they are. And so in light of that, 
<laughs> one of our uh, golden shoes emissions. I'll show you this very funny about just how much uh, 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 Michigan might be thinking about Georgia during practice. Uh, take a look at this here real quick. Georgia. Georgia. So if you're listening to podcasts, this is Jim Harbaugh with visions of through. Kirby Smart dancing his head. It's just as, an old sweet song. As Georgia plays in the background there. Keeps Georgia Very funny from uh Joel Sidney Kelly on that, who talks about the golden era there of Georgia football. Joel Sidney Kelly, very, very talented guy. Very, very funny stuff. And that is our golden shoe for today. Wanted you to get a chance to see that. Joel had sent that in. And with that, we'll wrap up today's program. So is Jim Harbaugh thinking too much about Kirby Smart in Georgia? Maybe, maybe not. But at least he's showing respect to the right team as opposed to some of these other talking heads who seem to be obsessed with everything else. So it's going to be a fun time. Listen. Uh, there are some really cool storylines ahead of this upcoming season. I told John Stinchcomb that I believe properly it should be understood that Georgia going for its go for three and 23 is the number one story of all. But, you know, Michigan trying to stay ahead of Ohio State in the Big Ten, that's for those of us who love college football, even apart from Georgia, that's a lot of fun. You know, Texas or Oklahoma trying to take advantage of one more year in a much weaker Big 12 than the competitive environment they'll find themselves in in the SEC. That is also really fun, too. The battle between Clemson, Florida State, and the ACC, that might not be too bad either. There's some cool stuff potentially ready to happen, and seeing how it all plays out will be fascinating. Now, what there is no mystery about is what's going to happen in the cocktail party when Georgia beats Florida. That's 110 days from right now, and that is our Gator Hater Countdown. Y'all have a great day. We'll see you back here tomorrow. Dog Nation Daily, presented by Pella Window and Door of Georgia. And on video, time now for the R.S. Andrews Cool Down. R.S. Andrews, the one you turn to for your air conditioning, heating, plumbing, and electric needs. They'll show up on time. They'll do the work that's promised. The price is promised. You can trust them on all of that. So make sure you check them out today. And if your water heater goes out, R.S. Andrews, in many cases, can replace that for you the same day. All right, I'm going to pop over here to our friends on YouTube. We'll start there today. We'll kind of bounce around the comment section. I know we didn't do very many comments on Fridays. We'll try to do a few more of those here right now. Uh, Thomas Dyson said, Arch Manning looked like a true freshman that just got on campus. I guess in some respects that's the case. Did you all see the video of like all the Texas quarterbacks? They're all kind of rocked up a little bit. Uh, Arch trying to flex for the cameras. I thought that was kind of funny. Um, a UGA boy for life brunetti says, I think if you model your team around UGA, I, it's okay with me. It's better than ESPN picking your Michigan Ohio State. I totally agree with that. Um, Christy reminding everybody to keep it PG over here. Christy, thanks for policing this YouTube section. You know how crazy and wild those folks can be. Uh, uh, Paul Moon, the subject of Malik, Malik Murphy, another one of those, you know, Texas quarterbacks. I mean, I think one of the kind of under the radar things this off season was the fact that a guy like Malik Murphy did not pay any more attention to the possibility of transfer. I mean, there were some folks who thought that Murphy might leave and go somewhere else and that, had he left, he would have had a pretty robust market around him, and ultimately he chose not to do that. Um, let's see what else. Uh, Frederick Meredith thinks that Malik Murphy is better than Arch Manning. Right now, that's probably the case. Arch Manning is probably the number three quarterback at Texas right now. Um, Arch Manning is probably number three at Texas. Howard Eubanks says Florida needs to show it instead of talking about it. Are they talking about it again? Um, they don't have much to brag about, so I'm not really quite sure what they'd be talking about. Uh, Memphis Dog says, I think no matter what the score, Texas-Bama will be good. Yeah, it's a really fun game. I mean, we have a handful of, I think, really fun week one, week two games. LSU-Florida State is one of the best games of the season. That's week one. Texas-Alabama week two. I mean, that's good stuff. And unfortunately, and I hate this, but it's going to be true – I mean, y'all, we're going to end up talking more. I mean, I say that, but we'll, we'll still be interested in like the individual players and who's playing what and who's do, doing what, and goodness knows we'll be dissecting every throw that Carson Beck makes. But, I mean, I remember when Tennessee played Alabama a year ago, I forgot who George was playing, but it was a home game. We were talking more about 
the Tennessee Bama game on our post game show than we were the Georgia game. And the following week here on the show was kind of that same way too, is that, and this was not because Georgia fans weren't interested in Georgia. Georgia was just so good that, that Georgia was rendering the games they were playing somewhat irrelevant. And I have a sneaking suspicion that we're going to end up talking probably more about some of these other games and then we're going to be talking about the Georgia game. Uh, and that's just kind of the way that goes. It's nobody's fault, I don't think, but it is probably true. Um, let's see what else. Uh, Johnny Surf Dog says, I think that Bama is in big trouble with its coaching staff. Just my opinion. I could be wrong. Uh, I don't know that I'm completely there yet. I mean, I think that everything with Bama is worth monitoring. You know, this is, on paper, the weakest quarterback they're going to have to start a season. That's just probably true in quite some time. Um, They are, I think, you know, going to be no better than the second-best team in the SEC West. I do believe LSU is better. The recruiting stuff right now, I think, is probably a little bit overblown because we've seen them get off to slow starts before and still put an elite class together. We've seen Georgia get off to slow starts before and put an elite class together. I guess my point is is that I do believe that Bama is still a contender. I mean, if you're the third best team in the SEC, you can still be among the national elite. So I still believe that Alabama is a contender. I still believe they're likely to put an elite recruiting class together. But the vibe is just a little bit different right now. I mean, I, I think the thing for Alabama is, is that they can't just lean on business as usual anymore because business as usual – the last two years has included not winning a national championship. And last year it included not making the college football playoff. And, you know, they've had two of the last four years in which they haven't made the college football playoff. That Bama is not a business-as-usual program anymore because business has sort of receded. That what Bama really needs is a catalyst. Bama needs a catalyst for greatness. This isn't just, hey, we're, we're going to lean on what makes Bama Bama and we're going to be fine. Uh, they need more than that right now. They're going to have to kind of tap into some sort of catalyst. Maybe Malik Murphy, the wide receiver, is not Malik Murphy. Uh, Malik, maybe Malik Benson, the wide receiver, is going to be that. Maybe Justice Haynes is going to be that. Maybe Caleb Downs is going to be that on defense. Uh, when I, I put the, it's never done that I put the accent on the wrong word. It's defense, not defense. Um, but the point is, it's not that they don't have potential catalysts. I think the offensive line could be a potential catalyst for them. But they need more than just to sort of lean on, hey, we're Bama, we're going to show the world we're still Bama. They need some new life, new blood, new energy, some sort of new enthusiasm around the program. For whatever reason, you know, Bryce Young was the best player in college football, I, I believe, uh, certainly among them. And, you know, uh, uh, Will Anderson was very, very close. And yet this team with those, with those kind of individual talents did not win national championships. And so kind of figuring out, okay, well, well then what if that wasn't the catalyst for championship success, the way that many people assume that it would be, then what will be that catalyst? Uh, what will be uh, that catalyst? And I'm not quite so sure. Uh, I believe we may have just gotten Georgia's media day uh, uh, players, the players going to media days here. Let's see if I can find that for you. We'll see if we can give that for you. Um, I see where South Carolina is going to send uh, uh, Spencer Rattler along with uh, uh, Kai Kroger, the, <laughs> the punter, is going to media days. Well, there you go there on that. Uh, let's see if we can find the Georgia ones here. I think the Georgia ones just came out. Um, yeah, a, a lot of these now starting to be announced here all across the SEC. All right, y'all tell me what uh, Georgia is going to be because I, I don't see it in my, in my feed here right now. Um, yeah, y'all tell me because I don't see those right now. But we'll keep the conversation going. Let me go to Facebook here for a moment. And I'll come back to YouTube in a minute. And as I said before, hope everybody's doing well today and having fun. Georgia quite a run in recruiting over the last week or so. That continues on the Facebook side of things. Ken Holcomb says, I hope Michigan kicks Ohio State's tail again and the dogs kick Michigan's again. We have another all-SEC natty again with the dogs winning all again. I like all of that, Ken. I really do. Um, no love loss between most Georgia slash SEC fans, the Big Ten. And I think that's probably the way that it's supposed to be. 
Good to see Mike Mazzell checking in the comment section, as always. Good to have him here. Uh, good to see April uh, Van Giesen checking in. Michael Ward checking in from Valdosta. Appreciate that. George Herndon says, our offense is the monsters of the hedges, the great wall of Georgia. George, I like that. Uh, that's really good stuff. Rody Williams says, Alabama is in trouble, period. They certainly could be. Um, I, I think the next 12 months, both in recruiting and on the field, are going to be very, very telling. Are going to be very telling. Uh, William Camacho picking Texas to beat Alabama, and that's kind of the one, that's the game we've had circled. We've been talking about that one for quite some time. Might believe that Texas wins that game. William saying that there, too. And if that happens, that is a seismic result, y'all. That is a seismic result, which would really change a lot of things about how this college football season is going to be discussed. Philip Jordan Wells in here having fun, for sure. Randy Hall says, if we get K.J. Bolden, do we get a chortle? I would say that K.J. Bolden undoubtedly is a chortle-worthy recruit. Undoubtedly, that's the case. The Bolden recruitment is also kind of interesting, too, where it seems like, you know, it seems like Georgia is in good position here, but it also seems like Ohio State's not really going away in all of that. And, you know, I don't know how seriously I take the recent entrance into the, to the race, the Auburns, you know. And listen, I'm not a recruiting reporter, so maybe maybe they should be taken very seriously. I'm not telling you they shouldn't be. I guess in my mind, I sort of still view this as Georgia versus Ohio State. And you love the idea of, you know, Georgia's completely pulled away here. This is Georgia's to win. Yet it seems like it seems like this is still an ongoing battle. I, I guess that's the sense that I get, is that one way or another, this is still an ongoing battle, which is probably not what you want. Let me go back to dognation.com and have some chatting and some conversation over there. Um, let's see what else. Okay, so Jacob Yarbrough says, uh, Brock Bowers, Kamari Laster, Cedric Von Prahn. I'd say that's pretty close to what we had suggested it would be. Um, and I think that you'll start thinking about, you know, Kamari Laster's placement here just kind of gives you a strong reminder of just how good of a cornerback that could be for Georgia. This could really be a big year for Laster. So uh, thank you, Jacob. I appreciate you sharing that. I, I looked at my feed and didn't see it and looked to see if I'd gotten any kind of email about that, and I hadn't. Uh, so there you go. Bowers, Laster, Van Praan, the official uh, SEC Media Days attendees for Georgia. I think that Georgia's made great selections there. I mean, I think that Brock Bowers is a good spokesman for Georgia anyway, but I do think when it's when it's at all possible, and there are some players who are just incredibly shy. And so I don't know that I want to force a super shy player to have to go do something he doesn't want to do. But when in all possible, you should have the very best players at college football at SEC Media Days. You just should. And so I think that Georgia was probably always likely to bring Brock Bowers. But that's one of those things of, People want to see Brock Bowers at an event like that. And making Brock Bowers as famous as you can possibly make him, I think probably serves, obviously, Brock well, but I think it serves Georgia well. So I'm really glad that he's going. And you know, SVP was as easy to rubber stamp in this event as anything. So that's really good. Um, really good group for Georgia. Uh, Brooks, he says, the talking head's real job is increasing viewership, nothing else. And I think that's true. But there's also kind of a sport to the to the argument thing. I mean, those of us who argue back and forth in these chats in comment sections, things like that, we sort of understand this. And the TV people are kind of the same thing. You know, like you think about like the Skip Baylesses or the Stephen A. Smiths, or if you want to bring it to college football, you know, the Greg McElroys, the whoever else, that you may be doing this for a job and your money may be relative to the interest that you bring in to the to the shows that you're on. But there is still sort of a natural ego, competitive spirit that kind of kicks in when you're doing some of these arguments. And I can promise you that if you're Skip Bayless, you want to win the argument. If you're Stephen A. Smith, you want to win the argument. And I mean, nobody wants to take the L in one of these arguments. And that's just kind of the way that goes. So there is an element in which, you know, you sort of you do what you do because that's what the job requires. But you better believe when it comes time to make the argument. You want to make an effective argument. And, you know, let's be honest. Sometimes in TV, 
it's sort of divided up of, well, I need so-and-so to make this case, and I need so-and-so to make that case. Like A lot of these opinions, in some respects, may be written by the producers. But even if you kind of have your opinion handed to you, you still want to be good at making a case for that. You, you just sort of want to be a good arguer. You know how, like, uh, you've ever had, like, debate team in high school or something like that? It's like you just want to be effective at making the argument, even if it's an argument that you don't necessarily hold as all that, you know, important of a take on like or if it's something you don't necessarily believe with all your heart soul and might you still want to be able to argue it effectively there's a certain competitive spirit that kind of kicks in on some of that kind of stuff y'all do that back and forth with each other all the time the guys on tv really are not that much different um this is a very good question richard d says if you, if you could get either justice haynes or jeremiah smith who would you choose and why that's a very good question. I think I'd probably say Jeremiah Smith because I do believe that Jeremiah Smith is the real deal. Um, but I thought that Justice Haynes was really good last year. I mean, I, I mean, it's one of those things that, like, my opinion on on Justice as a player doesn't change just because he went to Alabama. I, I I'd seen Justice as a junior, and I was you know I was impressed, but I wasn't like, oh my gosh. Um, I saw him last year at, at Buford and. There was a lot of what I saw from Smith, excuse me, Haynes, that I thought was really a lot. Of, there was a lot of wow factor to how how he carried the ball. Really, very impressed with him. But I believe I'd probably go Jeremiah Smith on that. That's a great question, though. Great question. If you could, if you could pick one, which one would you pick? Um, that's a great question. I think some of that's also kind of relative to the, what else you know, kind of Georgia has had at the position, maybe. Um, but I mean, I'll take the same question, slightly different, uh, you know, spin on it. So let's make the comparison. The two guys that went to Alabama, I believe that Caleb Downs is the better player between the two, but I believe I'd rather have Justice Haynes. If, if instead of comparing two guys across two classes, if I'm comparing the two guys that went to Bama a year ago, both of which I think are outstanding prospects, Downs I think was the best player in the state last year. But for Georgia, I believe I might would have rather had Justice Haynes. I think. Hunker Down 93 says, do you have any idea what high school games are going to be calling this year? So a lot of the regular season games, I don't know about. I mean, I, I'm, I should say this. I don't think I'm supposed to say yet. Uh, I think I, I, you know, the one, you know, one big question is, well, you know, how many times do you get a chance to do a Dylan Riola game? I mean, I know that it looks like a couple of times we're going to have Dylan. I, I'm not supposed to announce when these are yet, I don't believe. But there are there is some back channel about some of that, I think. Um, I also know my schedule for Corky Cal. Uh, let me see if I can find it. Um, uh, I don't see it right now. I was going to read you my Corky Cal schedule, but I'm doing, I'm going to get to do Scovey White, which I'm excited about. Uh, I've got some really good games for Corky Cal, really good games for Corky Cal. Um, so yeah, I, I've got a very, very full schedule. I'll just put it that way, but I'm, I'm, I'm glad about that. I'm glad about that. So it's going to be here before you know it. Thank you for asking, by the way. Um, Thomas Tyson says, going back to Bama, the personnel changes are alarming to me. Bama always had a stable of great quarterbacks and wideouts. Yeah, there's no doubt that uh, – now, they may be fine at wideout because, I mean, if the if the Benson kid, the, the junior college guy, is as good as some people want to tell you is, then they may they may be you know pretty, pretty close to a typical Alabama wide receiver. That ends up being the case. But the one in which the Alabama fans – even they, I think, would admit this is, is that it looks like Ty Simpson was just a misevaluation. And if that's the case, that's where it appears that Alabama's had big-time drop-off. Because if Simpson is sort of the five-star type guy they thought he was, paired with everything else they have going on, then that, even as a sort of a, a new starting quarterback, that would sort of feel like a pretty formidable same old Bama. Uh, but to go back to Jalen Milrow, after most Bama fans were you know kind of eh about Milrow a year ago, that's where that kind of disconnect kind of comes in. So a lot of this just sort of centers around the idea of sometimes you go out and get the big prospect, and they're just not that. And if you look at all the kind of five-star quarterbacks Bama has brought in over the years, I mean, some of these guys, you know, Blake Barnett, Star Jackson, people like that, they just sort of turn out not to be very good. And, you know, no one's immune from that. By the way, Georgia's not going to be immune from that. You know, of all these elite quarterbacks that Georgia's brought in, chances are one of them just not very good. Uh 
that's just the way the numbers game works on that. It seems like they all could be good, and any of them certainly have the capability of that, but odds are, you know, someone out of this group of how many years in a row that Georgia sort of brought in these sort of top-level recruits, someone from this group is going to probably not have the college career that you probably thought they should have, and Alabama may be dealing with that when it comes to Ty Simpson. Spencer Clark says, whatever happened to Blake Sims? That's a good question. So Sims is from Gainesville. That's my hometown. What is Blake Sims doing these days? That's a guy who I think kind of gets lost in the shuffle a little bit, and probably unfairly so. You know, Sims, you know, led Bama to the 2014 college ball playoff. That's an example of everybody in the world thought that Jake Coker was going to be Alabama's quarterback in 2014. He did become the quarterback in 2015, but Coker had transferred from Florida State. People thought he transferred to get the job. And then Blake Sims, who I think a lot of folks wondered if he was even going to play quarterback, ultimately won that job and helped lead Bama to the college ball playoff. The Blake Sims probably um, probably gets forgotten too much. Um, Freeman Durden, thank you, Freeman. He says that Sims is a coach in Georgia. Okay, that's good to know. Thank you. Uh, Jonathan Aaron says, am I going to go to media day? And if I do, I better not see any footage or any of those Texas ATM coaches. So I, tell, I told our first and 15 audience this a little earlier. I've actually decided that I'm not going to go to media days. I'm going to stay here. Um, I just think it makes more sense to do the show. Um, wouldn't mind being there. I think having it in Nashville is kind of fun and interesting for the first time. I think that's kind of cool. But I just sort of feel like I don't want to miss the show. We're getting too close to the start of the season. I want to keep the show kind of going like normal. And I just sort of think that's what I want to do. Phil Underwood checking in from Cape Town, South Africa. How about that? Uh, really cool, Phil. Thank you for checking in. That's awesome. What a cool thing, Phil. Hope you're having a good time, and we're uh, happy to see you here today. Thank you very much. Once again, I'm going to show my ignorance of, like, international dateline and time zones and things like that. Could not tell you what day it is. Could not tell you what time it is in South Africa right now. But what an amazing thing. I've had friends who visited South Africa before, and, you know, I mean, obviously the wildlife is, like, unlike anything, I mean, we could ever even match. I mean, and I, I'm, I'm sure, you know, Phil's getting a chance to experience some of that. In addition to, you know, obviously, you know, Cape Town and Johannesburg, these are pretty big cities in, in their own right. But but some of the, the, the true wildlife is unbelievable. unbelievable. In fact, I believe this is true. You know, how we have, like, former presidents and world leaders, you know, uh, founding father types on our currency. I believe in South Africa, isn't this true? Doesn't South Africa have pictures of animals on its currency? Isn't that true? I think that's right. Um, what an amazing thing. Amazing thing. Uh, all right, final comments. Kenny Mack giving a shout-out to what he calls the Cape Town dude. There you go on that. Avion Curry says South Africa is only six hours ahead. Is that true? That's amazing to me. I would have thought it had been like three days ahead. <laughs> like I'm actually really surprised. Uh, that, that's only six six hours ahead. That's really interesting. Um, that that's actually pretty fascinating. Pretty good stuff. Uh, all right, final comments here. Howard Eubank says our senior offensive lineman will dominate and go out on a high note. Yeah, uh, we talked about this before. When you look at the, the success that Georgia's had recruiting these offensive linemen as of late, one of the selling points may have been how much Georgia's going to need guys in the program as soon as next year. Where I guess you stand to. You know, Howard mentions the seniors, but we think about a guy like Marius Mims who could also leave there as well, that you could have as many as four starting offensive linemen to replace for next season. Uh, other comments? We got breaking news here. <laughs> Greg McElroy joins me on the Texas Island. Yeah, I don't know about that. I don't know if I want to be thought of being on Texas Island, nor do I want to necessarily share an island with Greg McElroy, but that's pretty funny. But I will say that McElroy saying what he said does make me feel a little bit better about my Texas pick because, as I said before, like ultimately, I don't want to be wrong about my playoff picks. I mean, I'm not going to get punished for being wrong, but ego-wise, you want to be right. Or it, you at least don't want to be laughably wrong. See, part of the reason why some of y'all still give me a hard time about Texas A&M is because in the past, when I talked up Texas A&M, I wasn't just wrong, I was laughably wrong. And that's the thing you really want to try to avoid. So knowing that, Greg, even though I don't want to share an island with McElroy and don't really want to be on Texas Island for sure, um, uh, it still is somewhat comforting to know that I'm not the only one now saying this. makes me feel a little bit better, I guess. 
So, yeah, uh, that's very funny, Michael. And by the way, good to have Michael back from vacation. Uh, Frederick Meredith says it's really hard for me to see Georgia not winning the national championship this year. And, Frederick, I, I, I agree with you. I do. I think that you would have to strain yourself to kind of make. Now, listen, the one thing that we none of us can see is sort of what what is behind door number three. You know, we, we don't really know the surprise that could be in store for the season, and college football has a way of surprising you. So, obviously, we can't foresee that. If we could, it wouldn't be a surprise. So, that's the caveat to all of this. Based on the tangible stuff that we can see with our own eyes, there is just not a very convincing case, I don't believe, against Georgia for the upcoming season. I believe you're right about that. Um, all right, final comments. Uh, Kenny Mack says, love all those giants that committed once they uh, hit the conditioning for the upcoming year. They're going to be even scarier. Yeah. I always say it's one of the most amazing things to me about just how quickly that Georgia has the ability to transform a body. And Georgia's not the only program that's like this, but it's the one we pay attention to. Is that, you know, when you give these guys like the perfectly kind of tuned nutrition to go along with obviously the weight program that Scott Sinclair is putting them in, you know, big guys drop weight, boom, very fast. Small guys beef up very fast. It's just amazing how these young, you know, sort of, you know, perfect genetic type you know young men how quickly their bodies become even more enhanced just because of the kind of nutrition the weight room stuff they get it happens very fast um let's see what else josh campbell says i'm always a, a fan of whatever sponsor supports the show in some cases that is the case that i have become a fan like i didn't know what the finished long drink was before they uh became to sponsor the show I, I'll, I'll admit that i was asked to try some and i really liked it and that's why the Finnish long drink wanted to advertise on the show is because people like me may not have known what it was. The truth is I wasn't even all that familiar with that category of beverage, the idea of kind of the ready-to-drink cocktail, the mixed drink. I wasn't that, that aware of that category of beverage, and that's why the Finnish long drink wanted to, um, wanted to advertise because they wanted to educate people about what they were, and I, I think we've done a good job for them. All of a sudden now you kind of see the Finnish long drink everywhere, so we've obviously helped you know, kind of get that message out. That's an example of a sponsor that I came to like after being introduced to them because they were interested in being a part of the show. That is that is 100% true. But in the case of Dr. Pepper and Royal Caribbean, you know, two completely different sponsors. Y'all, I mean, I don't, I didn't bring my lunch with me today. I take two Diet Dr. Peppers with me everywhere I go, uh, everywhere I go. And, you know, I've been drinking Dr. Pepper since I was a kid. Now, back back in the old days, it was the fully leaded version of the Dr. Pepper. Now it's more like Dr. Pepper Zero Sugar or Diet Dr. Pepper, something like that, which I do very much enjoy there as well. And I, mean, I was taking Royal Caribbean Cruises 20 years ago. So there are a handful of sponsors that I've also been loyal customers to for a long time. And you cannot get more. Like the day I found out that Dr. Pepper was going to be on Dog Nation Daily, I did backflips uh i was so happy about that just that's just one of those things where like you know you just kind of like sometimes you know having you know brands that you really enjoy uh in fact i brought the dr pepper can back from la remember that the uh, it's actually sitting right over here the uh the the dr pepper college ball playoff can they had out there for sure um all right a couple more comments we're ready to go Uh, Johnny Serve Dog says Kirby and Bobo saw how our size advantage was a weapon against TCU, and now they're doubling down on it. Bully ball here to stay in Athens. I mean, I think there's some fairness to that. That like <laughs> there was a thing that Bill Walton used to say, and like Bill Walton now is like a total cartoon character. But like back in the '90s, Walton was a somewhat conventional TV broadcaster. He was on the NBC broadcast. It was Bill Walton and like Steve Snapper Jones. I forget who the play-by-play guy was on that. But that was like the number two team on the NBA broadcast on NBC. And people used to make fun of Walton back then, but back then he was much more of kind of a conventional broadcaster. And like one of the things that I think Jim Rome used to always laugh at uh, Bill Walton for was supposedly one time Walton said, it helps to be tall when you're playing this game, which obviously in basketball it does. Um like in college football, it's kind of the same way. And I talked to John about this a little earlier. As simplistic as it sounds, it's just really good to be that much bigger than your opponent. Like that's a very good thing. That that football is hard, but football against a man who's six inches taller than you and 
30 pounds heavier than you, that borders on impossible. That is, it is very, very hard to do battle against guys who are so much bigger. And your point about like a TCU, like TCU is sort of representative of kind of the mid-level power five team. They happen to work their way up to the college football playoff a year ago, but they're kind of a mid-level power five team. They win a lot of games, but, but they're not ever going to be confused with George from a roster standpoint. And I told you all before, uh, I wish I would have said this in the show because this is, a, I think, a really good point, is in L.A. prior to the, to the national championship, I got caught up in the TCU team as they were walking to media day there that day. I remember walking around like, like I was like surrounded by TCU players. I just sort of happened to kind of get caught up in their little caravan walking into the convention center. I remember thinking, these guys are small. These guys are tiny. Um, and it's just one of those things when you're as big as Georgia is and as big as Georgia seems to want to be in the future, you're just rendering half the country unable to compete with you from the word go because the kind of elite athlete who has that kind of size, that's a small number of prospects and recruits in any given year. And so when you're getting more than your fair share of those, you're sort of rendering anybody who doesn't have that same level of size non-competitive from the word go you've essentially taken taken half the country three quarters of the country maybe even and you've x'd them out as competition from the word go that's what stuff like this does i think you're right about that um christy says y'all ever have a pc from the from the varsity um wait like uh i know an an fo was a frosted orange what is a pc the FO was the frosted orange. My dad used to like that. What was the PC? I should probably know that. Um, I should probably know what that was. All right, let me get a, a one more trigger in the comment section. Chocolate milk on ice. Okay, thank you, Christy. I did not know that. I bet that was good, though. Um, yeah, I, I still like the varsity. I don't get a chance to go very much. I probably go to the... <laughs> Like my varsity experience now is probably going to the one in Dawsonville. Every now and then I'll just go way up 400 and go to the one in Dawsonville. That's probably about as varsity as I get these days. Um, but I still like it. I like the I like the double chili uh, burger. You know, um, two patties, cheese, chili, and I want a lot of chili on it. That's my varsity order now. It, I like the double ch- uh, double chili cheese burger. That's what I want. Um, all right, uh, last comments. We've got to go. Johnny uh, Prescott says fries or rings. I kind of go without that. Um, uh, I, I've never liked onion rings. Um, I know the varsity onion rings are famous. I've never really liked onion rings, period. Fries are fine. But I am very particular about French fries. One of these days we'll talk about how weird I am when it comes to French fries. I am very particular about French fries. Um very particular about that. So for me, I just sort of double up on the, uh, I just get two of those burgers and just be just be fine. You know, no fries, nothing like that. Bill Russell says, um, uh, dogs have 11 top 100 recruits. That's very impressive. And it is, Bill. Very, very impressive. Um, yeah, Double Dog says, PC's the plain chocolate on ice. Uh, thank you, Double Dog. I appreciate that. Um no, Cam Hasty, yeah, Finish Long Ring's still a sponsor. There's, they're absolutely still uh, – their doghouse on Friday, uh, on the show on Wednesdays. Yeah, Finish Long Ring's still here. Uh, I, I, wasn't, I wasn't pouring one out for the Finish Long Ring. I just was – I was comparing the difference between the fact that we do have some sponsors that I become aware of because they want to sponsor the show. And uh, I was really this, – this is the honest truth, is um, – uh, they wanted me to make sure I liked it before they wanted to come on board because uh, that's just the way, you know, like advertising only works when it's truthful that uh, they, and so they were kind enough to let me try some and I did like it. I thought it was really good. It's been a fixture for our, you know, weekends and things like that ever since then. Uh, And so that's the way the advertising is supposed to work. You know, uh, like I've heard people even say for like, you know, Facebook and some of these things without their feeding the ads to you. There are some people who like that. They want to be introduced to things they didn't know about already. And, you know, Finish Long Drink's an example of that. We were introduced to something that we didn't already know about, and that's kind of the way advertising is supposed to be. Um, ooh, Third and Will. This is a very good point. I have now uh, blasphemed 
folks who live down in like Vidalia, Vidalia High School. Um, who's the running, the linebacker the Georgia guy of class 2017? Uh, apologize to him, Nate McBride. I've insulted Nate McBride. I've inserted uh, insulted third and Will here, saying I don't like onion rings for the folks down in Vidalia and the great Vidalia High School program. Uh, that is indeed the case. Uh, so third and Will, you are right about that. That is an opinion I should have kept myself. All right, uh, back on YouTube. Final time we're going to go. All right, anything else? Uh, yeah, so the junior var- junior varsity not quite the same thing as like the regular varsity. I, I would agree with that. Um, I guess they're also kind of opening that new varsity now on 316. You know, the one in Athens has been gone for a little while. They're going to open that new one there on 316. I'm guessing I'll probably go there. Um, sometimes I go 129 to get to uh, Athens, but a lot of times I'll go 316. I'm guessing – I'll go there. DMART42 mentioned Nate McBride. Yeah, uh, third Will's talking about being from Vidalia, and I was also mentioning uh, Nate McBride, who was also from Vidalia, as someone else that would be offended if I said I didn't like onions. Um, Jonathan Aaron says, I know a lot of teams say it's championship or bust, but do you think that it'll ever be that way with uh, the run that George is on? Yeah, I, I, we'll finish with this because we've got to go after this. Um, I think my mindset about this is, is that like for Georgia, after you've won the last two national championships, there's no denying that's your goal for the upcoming season. And as devastated as I'd be if Georgia didn't win th- three straight, because that's just such a cool thing to be able to do. You know, I don't know that that even with Georgia having won back to back national championships, I don't know that the only way I could define success for Georgia is through a national championship. I still believe that you know if you navigate your regular season, if you get to the college football playoff then whatever happens in the college football playoff, I mean, there is a certain element of that that's kind of a toss-up. I mean, Georgia played a knockdown, drag-out game against Ohio State. That's just, you know, the way that all played out. That's, you know, kind of a toss-up. Um, and had Georgia lost that game at the last second as opposed to winning on the last second, you know, what I felt wildly different about the season for Georgia, I don't know that I necessarily would have. I mean, um, I think your job is to put yourself in contention for a championship every year and if you can do that enough years then the odds are going to kind of be in your favor of you know winning a good number of championships over the course of the long haul so I mean so to kind of finish the point there's no doubt that the stated goal for Georgia this year is to win a national championship that's that's what it would be after you've won two straight and yet if Georgia falls short of that assuming they make the college football playoff assuming they're in it to the end you know, I don't know that I'm going to have a frown on my face, the, you know, the entire offseason next year if Georgia were to do that because, you know, putting yourself in contention, giving yourself, you know, a, a, a shot to do it is ultimately, I think, what the ultimate goal is supposed to be. So kind of a complicated answer to a relatively simple question where Georgia's goal is going to be to win a national championship. But even after two straight national titles, I don't quite believe that's the only way I would define success for Georgia for this upcoming season. Uh, but probably a topic worth getting into – a little bit more there in the future. All right, for now, we will make that our R.S. Andrews cool down, and we will invite you to check out R.S. Andrews online at rsandrews.com for your air conditioning, heating, plumbing, electric needs. They'll show up on time. They will do the work that's promised the price. that's promised you can trust them on all of that. So make sure you check them out today, including getting that air conditioning unit tuned back up to factory fresh specs. Find them online at rsandrews.com. Y'all have a great day. We'll see you back here tomorrow. Dog Nation Daily presented by Pella Window and Door of Georgia. We'll look forward to talking to you then.